This month's programme is about the giant planets of the solar system. Sky watchers are known about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn since ancient times. Then the astronomer William Herschel discovered Uranus on the 13th of March 1781. Herschel wasn't originally an astronomer, uh, he was a musician. He came of a musical family and for a time he played in the Hanoverian band. Then, when he came over to England, he became organist at the Octagon Chapel in Bath, which incidentally no longer exists. It was pulled down a very long time ago. And about this time, in the early 1770s, uh, he composed some music. Herschel's music is very seldom played now, and uh, I thought you might just like, as a rather historical curio, to hear part of one of his compositions. I don't know quite when it was written, about 1772, I should think. I wonder when that was last played. About 1800, I should think. The astronomers John Gall and Heinrich Diorest, working at the Berlin Observatory on the 23rd of September 1846, discovered the planet Neptune. It is interesting to note that the dwarf planet Pluto, that was discovered by American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh in 1930 is linked to the 149th anniversary of the dis discovery of Uranus. The telegram announcing Pluto's discovery was not sent until the 13th of March. In 2006 Pluto was downgraded by the International Astronomical Union to that of a dwarf planet since it is actually one of many large objects to make up the Kuiper belt beyond Neptune's orbit. We do not often hear about the outer planets and now is a good time because there is interesting things happening in the weather systems of the planets Saturn and Uranus which is causing excitement among planetary astronomers. In addition, the planet Neptune was in opposition on the 1st of September 2014 and Uranus will be at opposition on the 7th of October. A planet is at opposition when it lies opposite to the Sun in the sky and is therefore best placed for observation. All of the outer planets have a large number of moons, Jupiter 67, Saturn 53, Uranus 27, Neptune 14 and Pluto 5. I will be devoting a whole program to these in the near future. In this month's program, I will be concentrating on the planets themselves. The general layout of the solar system is shown here. We have the Sun in the centre, and moving outwards in order of distance, we come to the rocky planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Then comes a wide gap, filled with over 3,000 chunks of rock, called the asteroid belt, followed by the giant gaseous planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. At this huge distance, heat from the Sun is very feeble and the pressure is huge the deeper you descend through the clouds. Hydrogen, ammonia, methane gases are prominent while the wind speeds reach upwards of thousands of kilometres an hour. Let us begin with Jupiter, since it is the first of the outer planets. At about 3 a.m., look low in the eastern sky and the planet will immediately attract your attention due to its brilliance. It shines at magnitude minus 1.9 and lies midway between the head of Leo, the lion, which has the appearance of a reverse question mark of stars, and the cancer of a crab. 
It is the fifth planet lying at a mean distance of 778 million kilometres from the Sun and with an equatorial diameter of over 142,800 kilometres, Jupiter is a giant of the Sun's family. The planet spins very rapidly so that a day here is less than 10 hours long. This in, in turn causes Jupiter's equatorial region to bulge and the polar diameter to be reduced by 9,000 kilometres, giving the planet a plump appearance in small telescopes. Jupiter takes 11.86 years to orbit around the Sun and is currently moving away from us in the most distant region of its orbital path. It will be at Aphelion on the 17th of February 2017 when it will be at its most remote point from the Sun. Jupiter has 67 moons, including the four large satellites discovered by Galileo Galilei in 1609. These are named Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. These Galileans are easily visible in a pair of binoculars, so you can watch them change positions as they move around the planet. These images of Jupiter were taken by Australian amateur Trevor Barry using a 40 cm reflector. The planet's apparent diameter is reasonably large at 34 arc seconds, so there is much to be seen, and a reflector telescope of 15 cm is enough to allow you to do useful work. For example, the carving of the transits of cloud features across the planet's central meridian, including the famous Great Red Spot. In the weeks ahead, the planet will drift slowly towards Leo before reaching a stationary point on the 8th of December. When its motion will reverse, Jupiter will be at opposition on the 6th of February 2015. There is one important point to be made. Jupiter's famous Great Red Spot, which was first recorded by Robert Hooke on the 26th of June 1666, is the planet's trademark. At its greatest extent, it measures 40,000 kilometres long and 14,000 kilometres wide. The only other planet with a similar feature is Neptune. Voyager 2 discovered the great dark spot in 1989, which measures 10,000 kilometres in length. It is therefore a quarter of the size of Jupiter's red spot. Saturn is now visible low in the western sky after sunset, shining at magnitude plus 0.6, and is presently moving towards superior conjunction, which will occur on the 6th of November. The planet lies in the constellation of Libra the Scales. Saturn is a sixth member of the Sun family, lying at a mean distance of 1,433.5 million kilometres from the Sun and has an equatorial diameter of over 120,500 kilometres. Like Jupiter, the planet spins rapidly so that a day here is just over 10 hours long. In Saturn's case, the polar diameter is reduced by 11,800 kilometres. The planet takes 29.6 years to orbit around the Sun and, like Jupiter, is presently moving away from us on the far side of its orbital path and will arrive at Aphelion on the 17th of April 2018. These images of Saturn were again taken by amateur astronomer Trevor Barry, who lives in Australia, and show the planet's splendid rings but are easily visible in small telescopes. The angular diameter of Saturn is now 15.6 seconds of arc, therefore a telescope of 25 centimetres is the smallest that will allow you to do useful work, such as the timing of cloud features across the planet's central meridian. Unlike Jupiter, atmospheric features visible in Saturn's atmosphere are rare, Having said that, during 2014, Saturn has been exciting planetary observers with the appearance of a small dark spot in observations made during May 
and the large white disturbance in the equatorial zone of Saturn's cloud bands in August. Trevor Barry informs me, of greatest interest, on the 21st of August, he emitted a very large bright equatorial zone feature. It was more than just a spot and seemed to have visible structure associated with it. Again on the 24th of August, Trevor imaged the same feature and once again on the 27th of August. Each time it was well resolved and easily measured. This feature is of great interest to the researchers that he collaborates with, which include the British Astronomical Association. Even though this feature was at 9 degrees north latitude, Trevor was asked to measure its drift in longitude. All of the results indicate an increase in the zone's wind velocity that had previously been measured. Trevor says that due to the extremely high wind velocities in the equatorial zone of Saturn, features tend not to be long-lived. This is the brightest and most interesting feature he has imaged in the equatorial zone to date. Trevor is also tracking the anticyclone fossil from the great storm which formed in December 2010. This area of high pressure is the sole remaining remnant of that storm and he recently captured it along with the large bright oval on the 27th of August. White spots have appeared on Saturn in the past. On the 7th of December 1876, astronomer Azef Hall discovered a white spot in the equatorial zone while observing the moon Iapetus. One was seen in 1903 and another was observed in 1933. On the 3rd of August of that year, the British amateur Will Hay, the stage and screen comedian, discovered a prominent white spot in the equatorial zone. The spot was oval in shape and one-fifth of the planet's diameter in length, both ends being well defined. It quickly became prominent and visible in a 15 centimetre telescope. Will Hay described how the spot on the days after discovery lengthened rapidly in the preceding direction. It went on to occupy the whole width of the zone in latitude, even at one time encroaching on the north equatorial belt. The following end remained moderately well defined for several weeks. Others have occurred since, such as the Great White Spot of October 1990, seen in this disc drawing. A. Montalevo, who was observing with a 31 cm reflector in Los Angeles, first saw it on the 24th of September. Clearly, more observations are needed, so if you have a suitable telescope, please try your hand at observing Saturn and taking astronomical photographs of this splendid planet. Saturn will next become visible in the dawn sky during December, shining at magnitude plus 0.6. It is still in the constellation of Libra, and by the end of the year, it will be rising three hours before the sun. Now let us turn our attention to the planet Uranus, and once again, let me show you where to find it. The planet lies in the constellation of Pisces, the fishes, below the magnitude plus 4.4 star, Delta in the lower of the two fish. At magnitude plus 5.7 it is too faint to be seen easily with the naked eye so a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars will show it reasonably well. The planet is at opposition on the 3rd of October 2014. The discovery of Uranus is interesting. Behind me is the William Herschel Museum at 19 New King Street in Bath which is famous worldwide and open most days. It is well worth a visit. Here is a selection of photos from Patrick Moore's private collection showing inside the museum. Frederick William Herschel was born on the 15th of November 1738. His father was bandmaster of the Hanoverian Guard and most of his children inherited his musical ability. William was no exception, and at the age of 15, he entered the band as oboist. He soon found that he did not care for army life, 
the Seven Years' War was raging, and after some unpleasant experiences during the Battle of Hastenbrook in 1757, he left the band and came to England. Fortunately, he was a gifted musician and had little trouble in earning his living. In 1765, he became organist at Halifax. During the following year, he moved to Bath as oboist in an orchestra which played daily in the still famous pump room, he, and he then became organist at the Octagon Chapel. In addition to the oboe, he played the violin and harpsichord, and later the organ. Though he was a professional musician, music was never everything to Herschel. He had always been interested in astronomy, and in 1771 he turned to it as a serious hobby. He hired a small reflecting telescope and enjoyed using it, but it was not powerful enough to satisfy him, and he looked around for something larger. Unfortunately, he found that the price of a bigger telescope was more than he could afford, so the only solution was to make his own. The Newtonian reflector consists of a primary concave mirror that collects the light from the object on view. It is then focused up the main tube onto a small flat mirror angled at 45 degrees and then out of the side of a tube into the eyepiece where it is magnified. The most important and expensive part of the instrument is the main concave mirror. Nowadays, mirrors of this kind are made of glass but during the 18th century, they were more commonly made of a special alloy known as speculum metal. Herschel decided to be become a telescope maker, and in June 1773, he began work. He had to continue his musical profession, but all his spare time was spent with his mirrors. Eventually, he produced a 12.5 cm speculum, but before this, he had made many failures. By this time, he had been joined by two of his, of his family. His brother Alexander was also a musician and a skillful amateur mechanic, and his sister Caroline. Alexander left after a time, but Caroline remained with her, William and became an astronomer in her own right. Actually, she went on to discover six comets. Herschel's first recorded observation, a sketch of the Orion Nebula, was made on the 4th of March 1774, and so his first successful reflector opened up new fields to him. He then concentrated on making larger and better telescopes, as well as on his musical career. Herschel was particularly interested in the way the stars are distributed in space. He knew them to be suns, and he knew them to be immensely distant. Years earlier, Thomas Wright of Durham, originally a clockmaker's apprentice and then a teacher of mathematics, had written a book in which he suggested that the stars might be arranged in the form of a disc. Wright died in 1785. When Herschel began work, he knew that the only way to find out was to undertake a long series of practical observations. He therefore decided to use his telescope to review the sky, counting the stars in certain selected regions and noting their distribution. William Herschel was partway through his review of the heaven when on March the 13th, 1781, he came across an object in the constellation of Taurus, the bull, not far from the double star 132 Tauri. He did not look in the least like an ordinary star. Instead of being a point of light, it showed a, a distinct disc, rather greenish in hue. Herschel was using a homemade telescope of 210cm focal length and a 15.5cm mirror, about 6 inches and he knew that the instrument was a good one, so that he was confident of the correctness of his observation. During the following nights, he discovered that the curious object seemed to be moving slowly against the stars, therefore it must be much closer than the stars themselves. Herschel naturally took it to be a comet. Indeed, his paper to the Royal Society, giving details of this of a discovery, is entitled Account of a Comet. 
Once several observations of a moving body have been made, the orbit can be worked out. The Finnish astronomer Andes Lexel, then a professor at St. Petersburg in Russia, Lexel found the object was not a comet at all. It was a new planet moving around the Sun at a distance much greater than that of Saturn. Astronomers all over the world were taken completely by surprise. It had not occurred to them that Saturn might not, after all, be the most remote planet and the discovery was completely unexpected. Yet there could be no doubt that Laxell's calculations were right. Herschel became famous at once and the king, George III, appointed him Royal Astronomer. Not Astronomer Royal, the official post was at that time held by the Reverend Neville Maskelyne at a salary of £200 per year. The grant was not enough to make Herschel rich, but it did allow him to abandon music as a career so that he could spend the rest of his life on astronomical work. In gratitude to the king, Herschel proposed the name the new planet Gorgion Sidious, the Georgian star. Foreign astronomers naturally objected, and finally the planet was christened Uranus as one of the mythological gods. Uranus is a giant gaseous planet, about 51,000 kilometres in diameter, lying at a mean distance of 2,872 million kilometres from the Sun, and it takes 84 Earth years to travel around its orbital path. The unusual feature about Uranus is that it is tilted over on its axis by 97 degrees so that it is situated almost horizontal to the plane of its orbit around the Sun. The only other planet with a large axial tilt is Venus which is 177 degrees. However, the rest of the planets have normal upright axial tilts. For Uranus, this means that as seen from the Earth, the planet is presently seen sideways onto us. The planet also has 27 known moons, 9 small outer satellites, 12 small inner moons and 4 large satellites that have been known since before the Space Age. The largest are named Ariel, Miranda, Umberio and Titania. There is a second important point of interest. All of the outer planets, including Uranus, have ring systems, while only those of Saturn are the most extensive and easily visible in small telescopes. The planet Uranus has an apparent diameter of only 3.6 seconds of arc, so observations of Uranus require a reflector telescope of at least 30 centimetres, that's 12 inches, which will, which will show you the blue-green disk of Uranus and the four main satellites. It is also possible to begin to see features in the planet's atmosphere. Weather on any planet can be quite unpredictable. In August 2014, astronomers working at the William Keck Observatory on the island of Hawaii were surprised by this appearance of gigantic swirling storm systems on Uranus. In contrast, during the Voyager encounter with Uranus in 1986, only a scant handful of dim clouds were seen in its atmosphere. In a press release, Imk D. Pater, professor at the University of College Berkeley and the team leader, said they were always anxious to see the first image of the night of any planet or satellite as they never knew what it might have in store. This extremely bright feature was seen on the 6th of August 2014 and it reminded Professor Inc of a similarly bright storm they had seen on Uranus's southern hemisphere during the years leading up to 2007. It said that since 2007 Uranus's North Pole has been coming into view and the South Pole is no longer visible. The bright feature Professor Inc Dipato refers to is known as the Berg because this feature was visible just below the polar haze and resembled an iceberg peeled off an ice shelf. The Berg oscillated in latitude between southern latitudes 32 and 36 degrees since 2000 and perhaps 
dated back to the Roger area of 1986. In 2004 it became much brighter, in 2005 it started to migrate towards the equator and became a very powerful storm system. In 2009, when it came to within a few degrees of the equator, it dissipated. The new storm seen this year is brighter than the Berg. It makes up is similar and the team expect that it may also be tied to a vortex in the deeper atmosphere. From near-infrared images taken at 2.2 microns, the team have already determined that the storm must reach high altitudes. Professor Kuno Sayanji, who is Assistant Professor of Planetary Science at Hampton University, told me that they have a Hubble Space Telescope proposal to observe Uranus if the storm becomes large enough to be seen by amateur astronomers. Amateur astronomers around the world have been making a heroic campaign to image a storm in, in order to catch the tempest, he said. Such observations are necessary in order to accurately point the Hubble Space Telescope. It takes at least 21 days to get the Hubble Space Telescope pointed, so it is important to have an accurate determination of the storm's motion so that they know that the Hubble Space Telescope can image Uranus while the storm is on the air-facing side of the planet. It is remarkable, he said, that modern technologies have allowed amateur astronomers with moderately sized telescopes to capture disc-resolved images of Uranus. Still, there has not been a confirmation of a storm in the amateur images so far. It seems that the storm, originally captured in Keck's 1.6 micron infrared band, does not appear bright in the visible wavelengths as seen with telescopes used by amateur astronomers. Amateur astronomers can clearly resolve the bright north polar hood, similar to the Keck images, and the storm appeared much brighter than the polar hood in the Keck 1.6 micron images, he said. By itself, this tells us something about the storm. Visible light does not penetrate as deep into Uranus' atmosphere as the near-infrared wavelengths, so perhaps these storms are active deep in the atmosphere. Professor Kuno Sayanji concluded by saying, amateur planetary photographers around the world are collectively gaining significant amount of experience through the current imaging campaign and the quality of images we have been capturing has been continuously improving in the past month. The dedication and skills we have developed is something he deeply admires. I think there is a good chance that they will pull off imaging the storm, so I am staying hopeful, he said. Moving further away from the sun, the planet Neptune is quite easy to find because it is located near Uranus in the sky. Neptune lies above the southern horizon in the constellation of Aquarius the water bearer below the great square of Pegasus. The planet shines at magnitude plus 7.8 so that it is fainter than Uranus and requires a small telescope to be able to see it. And due to its huge distance from the Sun, Neptune has an apparent diameter of only 2.5 seconds of arc. In our programme of July 2014, The Story of the Refractor, I gave a detailed account of a discovery of Neptune by John Gall and Irvin Leveria using the 23cm refractor at the Berlin Observatory on the 23rd of September 1846. Neptune is the eighth planet out from the Sun lying at a mean distance of 4,504 million kilometres and takes 164.8 Earth years to complete its orbital path. The planet is also a giant gaseous world like that of Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus and is 49,500 kilometres in diameter. The most prominent feature of Neptune is a great dark spot. It is unusual in the sense that Jupiter has a great red spot, while Uranus has none at all. Neptune has 13 known moons, and only one of these, Triton, is large and easy to see in a moderate telescope. 
The dwarf planet Pluto was discovered by American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh in February 1930 and presently lies in the star clouds of the Milky Way in the constellation of Sagittarius the Archer. At visual magnitude of 14.1 it is very faint and difficult to find. The last planet in the solar system to be discovered, Pluto is still very much a mystery. Located at more than 7 billion kilometres from the Sun, it is thought to be 4,900 kilometres in diameter. At this great distance, its angular diameter is only 0.1 of an arc second. Because of the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, it is very difficult to observe any details on the dwarf planet's surface. Pluto thus appears as a luminous point drowned amongst the millions of stars in the sky, but are at least as bright. Pluto's orbit is inclined by 17 degrees, so the planet can be one and a quarter billion kilometres above the plane, a distance of the same order of magnitude as the distance from the Sun to Saturn. In 1976, spectroscopic observations revealed that the surface of Pluto was partially covered in frozen methane, while the infrared spectrum identified ammonia and water ice on the planet. Pluto's atmosphere consists of a thin envelope of nitrogen, methane and carbon monoxide gases, which come from the ices of these substances on its surface. Pluto's elongated orbit is predicted to have a major effect on its atmosphere. As Pluto moves away from the Sun, its atmosphere should gradually freeze out and fall to the ground. When Pluto is closer to the Sun, the temperature of Pluto's solid surface increases, causing the ice to turn directly into gas. Pluto will next be at perihelion on the 15th of September 2237. Scientists using the submillimeter array in Chile have recently discovered that Pluto's temperature is about minus 230 degrees centigrade. The presence of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, in Pluto's atmosphere creates a temperature inversion, with the average temperature being 36 degrees warmer, 10 kilometres above the surface. The lower atmosphere contains a higher concentration of methane than its upper atmosphere. The NASA spacecraft New Horizons was launched on the 19th of January 2009 on the long journey towards Pluto and the Kuiper Belt at the outer edge of our solar system. On the 25th of August 2014, it passed Neptune's orbit. Observations of Pluto were set to begin in February 2015 and then on the 14th of July it will reach its destination. Altogether, the outer planets are fascinating worlds with their own weather systems and there is much for the amateur astronomer can achieve by making regular observations of Jupiter and Saturn and with suitable equipment, Neptune. You will be making a valuable contribution to our knowledge of the giant planets of the solar system. That is all we have time for this month. Please visit our website, the Mio, where you can watch all of the past shows of Astronomy in Space. And if you like this programme, please share it with your friends and members of your local Astronomical Society. When we come back next month, we will be looking at the autumn sky and the best deep sky objects on view. Until then, good evening. <laughs>